Alex Pax East is later this week. Yes, it is. Are you ready? Did you get your talk ready? Are you ready for uh, Pax East? I'm better. I'm better. I spent uh, a good chunk of this weekend. So on Friday, I went and saw Captain America, and then like okay. at various points during Captain America, would have like extreme moments of stress not caused by the film because I hadn't worked on this talk. Right. And then somehow I had enough beers that it subsided. And then I worked on it on Saturday, Sunday, and now I feel a lot better. Good work, good work. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> well, what would you have done if, like I said, it, did, it went horribly and, and, and I'm not confident and I'm canceling the talk? Did you have a, a separate sound effect ready to go? Uh, let's see. See, you didn't. <laughs> yes, that's the one I probably would have played in that situation. But I understand that. I, 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 above all people, certainly understand the idea of, you know, stress due to procrastination. And I'm very proud of you that you got uh, your stuff all together for the show because that is, that is a good thing. I did. Well, I, 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 what I did on Saturday was I looked through all the research I'd been, like, putting away in my note program for uh, since I gave the, the TEDx talk last year and then spent Saturday going through that and then kind of putting those links in in spots in the talk that I wanted to rewrite or add new information, and then yesterday I actually spent three hours writing all that stuff, Good. and then ran through it once or twice to get a sense of like where my length was at and if I what else I needed to do to it. So at least like I've done a pass on it. I feel like I'm in a better place, and then I'll work on it a little again today, and I'll do the slides when I'm on the plane on Wednesday, and we'll all be. I was gonna make a where your length is at joke, but you know what? I even even that's even that is too juvenile for me today. So we're just we're just gonna pass <laughs> that one right on by, and we're just gonna move on. So you feel good about Pax East? You feel ready? When is that talk of yours? When Friday is at place? four p.m. Okay, it's a couple hours before our meetup, uh, which I should mention. If you're interested in going to the Giant Bomb Game Spot meetup, there is a invite. There's a thing to sign up for on Facebook. Uh, that then links you to some set of tickets. I'm not sure quite how it works. I was just sent a link and told to tell people about it. And if you want to make sure that you have a spot uh, to hang out for two hours at a beer garden while some of us are there, uh, check my Twitter feed. I'd, I'd have to go and look uh, again. Uh, but there's a, it's at some beer garden from yeah. eight, to, 8 to 10, I believe. Yeah, I'm trying to think. what. It is. So you've got your talk on Friday. Then the mm -hmm. Giant Bomb panel is on Saturday night. I, recall right. I think it's at 9 uh, p.m. And then I think at the same time as the the wrestling packs thing that Just you at and Jeff, 10:30 on Sunday. Yeah, I believe that's the. I want to say it's the same time as Vinny and uh, Rich Gallup's like how to be a producer. Let's show bad clips from us being bad producers it's, over the years. It's not at the exact same time because Rich is also on the Royal Rumble oh. panel, so that would be a real problem. I thought it overlapped with something. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, but that is that that is Sunday morning as well. I think it might just be slightly later. It might be at eleven, so that might be yeah like that. I don't know. I thought I looked at it at one point, but either way, all that's going on. There's a lot, a lot going on that weekend, and uh, indeed, I don't, I'm I'm interested to see if there are any you know what kind of games show up at, at PAX East. I, I'm excited to see. It sounds like uh, Cappy might be showing off below. Uh, mm -hmm. which we haven't seen much of, so I'm looking forward to, to seeing what's going on there with that game. And it seems like there will be a pretty good you know, roster of indie stuff, as there often is. The, this is, as far as like major publishers go, it seems like there are a lot this year that are kind of sitting this show out. Uh, Nintendo's not really showing anything. Uh, I don't think there's really much of anything for Microsoft or EA or any of the, most of the other major publishers. It seems like most are just kind of choosing to, to, to skip this show. What do you think that is? It's hard, you know. This is a big E3. You know, this is going to be a lot of the coming out party for for next gen games. Uh, it could just be a factor of the fact that there are a lot of different cons at this point, and it seems like PAX is actually on the verge of announcing another one. Uh, there was a uh, tweet uh, from sometime last week in which they showed a clock that appeared to be set to Central Time. Uh, without any sort of countdown timer attached to it. So my my guess is that they are most likely planning something for uh, the central time zone, uh, of which there really could only be... Well, I guess there could be three options. There, It could be in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. it could be in Chicago, yeah. it could be in Austin. Uh, those are basically the only th real three options 
of my understanding of places that can that can hold major conventions. The major Star Wars convention used to be in Indianapolis. Chicago obviously has you know as a as a big city is prepared for that stuff. And then Austin is known for South by Southwest and and things of that nature. You know what city I'm rooting for if they have yeah. to go ahead and add another one. Obviously, it's Indianapolis because I know you love that city so so much. <laughs> Everybody loves Indianapolis, Indiana. It's one of the greatest cities in all of America, obviously. So, yeah, exactly. Who yeah. doesn't want to go to Indiana? Uh, nobody who knows anything, obviously. Yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, but I did see. I, like I said, I saw Captain America. That movie was pretty good. Yeah. So uh, how was? Because I I wanted to go see that, but the girlfriend was sick all weekend, so I spent most of my weekend tending to her and also watching professional wrestling. How how did you end up? So you like Captain America? What what was that movie all about? I thought I the first been... one was just okay. Yeah. I like Chris Evans. He's real charismatic. But it's a good uh, origin story, but it didn't have a lot of oomph past that origin. Point. And I thought I thought of the you know the Marvel movies aren't the the biggest technical marvels. Uh, ha ha! I didn't mean to do that. That's terrible. That's <sighs> yeah. Terrible. Uh, technically speaking, the CGI is not, let's say, best in class. Uh, right. Uh, M- Marvel is famously a penny pincher when it comes to everything about their productions. And I thought that movie in particular just looked, like the CG looked terrible, and I just I couldn't get into that world as much. Plus, I've just always really had a problem getting over the name Captain America. Like it's just, it was tough. Uh, Look, man, it came from a different time. It came from a time when the idea of Captain America was a rallying point and not something that just sounded super cheesy and jingoistic, all right? It's, it's, it just somehow was carried over. His name is Captain America. I know. Anyway, the second one is really great. Uh, okay. It's, it's like a, kind of what Marvel's been doing with some of these, you know, what do they call them, phase two films, where they're yeah. more kind of genre uh, as opposed to just like upping the ante of like bigger and bigger explosions and and things like that. Uh, certainly, a lot of that stuff happens, but you know, Captain America Two is more of like a political thriller. And yeah, I don't I don't want to get into spoilers or anything. It was the first weekend, but I will say I I really did enjoy it, and it was probably my favorite of the Marvel movies. The Thor ones, even though I think the stories in the Thor films are the worst of any of the Marvel films, I just like the characters and the universe a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, the the new Captain was really good. The action was. Very, very good. They somehow make a guy that isn't, you know, like a Norse god seem like a real badass in a way that uh, the Avengers or the original Captain America did not quite pull off. Well, I mean, it helps that, you know, Captain America has all that super soldier serum in him, so he can still be kind of a badass, but... Yeah, yeah. you know, I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, I, I want to see it very badly. Uh, I, you know, even though I have not really read any Marvel comics in years... Me uh, either. I have I have been enjoying the movies as they have come out. Uh, spe- the Iron Man series I think has been my favorite thus far. Uh, the first Iron Man movie I still think is the best among all of the uh, the superhero stuff that's been coming out lately. And I liked Iron Man three an awful lot. Uh, speaking of genre movies, that was in the genre of Shane Black movies, and yep. that is uh, definitely one of the best Shane Black movies of the last like decade or so. Uh, so I will go see Captain America at some point. I will just have to find someone to go see it with because my girlfriend could not care any. Any less about Marvel superhero movies? Oh, that's a bummer. We, yeah. Yeah, Katie's really into those. She is more of a DC girl, but the DC universe is <laughs> not not treated very well when it comes to its cinematic offerings. So uh, she has found a way to suck it up and enjoy the Marvel films. Yeah, yeah, it, it was the same for for Sam. Like the the Batman stuff, she would go see. Though uh, after Dark Knight, she she was one of the people who did not like Dark Knight that much. So I could not get her to go see Dark Knight Rises. It's why I didn't see Dark Knight Rises until almost a year later when I was sitting on an airplane. Oh wow! I, I had some time, so I had to go see it. Yeah, I don't know. It's like I I I I think the Dark Knight is is a slightly overrated movie, but I did enjoy it very much. She did not care for it. She really liked. Heath Ledger is the Joker, but did not like the movie at all. So mm. that is, you know, it's well, rough. If you, you, if, you need, very if, you need, uh, if you need people to go to see the movie with you, there's lots of people suggesting they'll go with you in the chat. So yeah, yeah, no, I I, I love going to movies with people that I don't know at all. That that doesn't make me feel super awkward or uncomfortable in the slightest. In no way. Perfect. Possibly. That's great. Uh, you yeah. know, I appreciate your honest reaction to that to that suggestion. Yeah, I think that will go really really well. And I want it all just like clam up and be like, yeah, okay, I guess let's let's go see the movie. Let's talk about the movies. <laughs> Did you get to play any games this weekend, Patrick? I, I finished. What did you play? I finished Burial at Sea. Okay. 
which I now understand all of the talk about how that ends. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to get into that, although it would be fun if you eventually get around to playing it to talk about the implications as they are deep Yeah. in terms of how they sort of put a bow Deep, I think you did there. Yeah, I'm doing those really... <sighs> At least Vinny does off them the on, top of the head. Vinny does them on purpose. Yeah. I'm just I don't know what's going on with my Monday. But I definitely see why people would be upset. I thought it was kind of neat mm-hmm. what they do uh, with the end of it uh, in terms of kind of putting all of that to bed and in, in a lot of ways they really do kind of put that all uh, to bed and uh, it you know it wasn't so much a reflection of like a rational wrapping up as much as I thought there might be some elements of that which makes sense given that I'm sure Ken Levine you know wasn't telling his staff that that studio was getting consolidated at the time that they were finishing it but just generally speaking I I really liked the fact that they took some chances narratively and uh, gameplay wise uh, in in barely at sea that I think I mentioned this when I talked about Burial C originally, uh, and when I first started playing Part Two, is that it if they were able to do some of this stuff so quickly here, th- there was real potential for this studio to do interesting things later as well, and they're right. not going to get that chance, which is which is kind of a bummer. But I will say, Burial C Part Two does a whole lot of a whole lot of retconning. I guess. Yeah, it is it is ba- basically retcon the DLC. So your okay. mileage may vary based on how you feel about the things they address. Now, how f- just without getting into specifics about what it is retconning, can you just say how far back it is retconning things? Oh, Alex, if I no, okay, I could just tell you afterwards. And... Well, just, you can just tell me afterward. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. No, it is the ultimate retcon. Okay. The ultimate retcon. Uh, and and and. You know that when I, that sort of stuff is just kind of getting into too much of uh, uh, kind of you know you know Bioshock's known for kind of end game twists and like that and so they certainly play into that in Burial C Part Two but some of the retcon stuff that didn't sit well with me was I don't I don't even know like it's 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 hard for me to reconcile it and it's difficult to talk about it without getting into to spoiler territory but basically they do seem to recognize some of the complaints levied against the game. Uh, Bioshock Infinite and try to address some of that through the particularities of the game's the Bioshock Infinite narrative, which allows for right. you know you know multiple universes and, and and seeing characters and places that you wouldn't be able to see them um, because you know where they're going to be and they find convenient ways for you to encounter characters that give them motivations that they maybe never had or were expressed in the original game that w- then led to very specific criticisms about the plot. Yeah. And they used the DLC, what feels like, to retcon in narrative motivations for characters that were not there in the first place, treating them as though they were deleted scenes, and then hoping that Burial Tea Part 2 allows you to feel like it was a full package uh, by, by getting a glimpse into those moments. And huh. it's sort of cheap. Uh, when it when it does that in some instances because it feels like they're just patching in narrative as a as a way of addressing complaints as opposed to you know it should have just been there in the first place as opposed to you just realizing well we'll just write this scene and this character will have this motivation and it all makes sense uh, so that doesn't sit so well but uh, the very ending which I think is kind of a fun. Uh, twist in the in the universe, uh, I thought was was pretty fun, and I really liked the stealth mechanics. I thought it played really really well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I haven't gotten to try any of episode two at all yet, so I'm I'm very curious about it. The way you were describing it, it was sounded like you know you're about to find out that all of Rapture you know took place inside a, the imagination of an autistic child or something, or no. you know like Patrick Duffy was going to walk out of the shower or something. It, it, you know, it, you made it sound like it was just the whole thing was about to go backwards. So well. Fair enough. No, nope. <laughs> don't explain. You don't have to put out details. I'm just like, it's I'm not quite not quite as far as we are going, but in terms of the Bioshock universe, it it goes pretty far. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, that certainly you know makes me 
want to actually pick up those last two episodes and start playing them again because I got like part of the way through episode one and then just stopped and haven't gotten one. A chance one is so short. One yeah. you know, was maybe two three hours, and uh, part two I think took me four. But I spent a lot of time doing the stealth. If you chose to engage in more of the the gunplay uh, and the enemies don't chase you very far, so even if you alert them, you you really don't need to go very far before they get locked behind a door. They don't know how to operate. Okay. So you, you could play that game much uh, more aggressive. Not to mention the one of the the main new plasmids they give you is the ability to uh, when you're uh, when you stay still, uh, you are invisible, and then even enemies that have spotted you will suddenly lose sight of you and stop attacking you. Um, and then there's another one where you can. Uh, you can see through... It's the same one. It's a variation on the same power. You can see through walls. Uh, and as you upgrade those, you get these sort of... Uh, you don't get options on upgrading. You just find, come across these plasma upgrades. Both upgrades allow you to, to use these powers without uh, using any of your uh, your EVE. So okay. you basically become, like, invincible because you can walk into the middle of a room, alert a bunch of guys, hold this trigger down, go invisible and never use up any Eve. Uh, okay. So you only use Eve when you move forward uh, with it. So it kind of breaks the game in some weird ways. But I, I I gave the game a pass kind of on those moments because I enjoyed the experimentation with the formula uh, rather than just saying, yep, you know, Elizabeth is just going to be a walking badass tank uh, just like everyone else uh, and instead try to do something a little different. I think that's fair. I think that's that's cool. And yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely want to play that stuff. And when I have some time, when I have some chance to sit down and not play all these other games that I'm not playing, I will definitely check those out. Uh, I wish I got to play more stuff this weekend, but it was kind of a crazy weekend. What with uh, Sick Girlfriend and WrestleMania and all of that, I did get to play a little more Rusty's Real Deal Baseball. Did you get a chance to check that out yet? No, not yet. It's, okay. I'm going to check it out with my transit this week, probably. It's a good uh, transit game. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to download it before I, I get on my flight, but that seems like something to mess with during takeoff and landing to get a at least some sense of it. But, you know what, we should. I forgot about that because I didn't watch it. Mm-hmm. What did What did you think of this WrestleMania? So, okay, I, it, this might be easier if you just ask me questions about WrestleMania because I don't want to, like, talk too far because I know you don't care about wrestling and you uh-huh. don't really understand what most of what I will be talking about means. Let me, so. Okay, I'll ask this. Okay. What is the streak? Okay. So you know who The Undertaker is, right? Yes. I was. That was back when I paid attention. Definitely. Yeah. So The Undertaker has never lost a match at WrestleMania. Okay. That is the, the ongoing thing. He had won 21 matches in a row against a variety of different opponents. Uh, and this year he was going... Do you know who Brock Lesnar is? Nope. Okay. Brock Lesnar is a guy who's been in and out of the WWE for years, and he was a legitimate UFC, like, heavyweight champion. Like, he was a legitimate shoot fighter, you know, MMA okay. fighter. Um, he's been back in the WWE on and off for the last year or so. He just kind of shows up occasionally, fights big matches, and then leaves. Uh, and they decided this year they were going to have Brock Lesnar fight The Undertaker. And the presumption amongst, let's say, 99% of the wrestling-watching world was that The Undertaker would just beat him because he's not around that often. And when The Undertaker would lose, if he would ever lose this streak, the presumption was that he would lose to someone that the the, the company really wanted the crowd to get behind, someone young mm-hmm. that they wanted to push big, you know, into the spotlight. Well, yeah, because it's, it's a business. They're... It's a business. You gotta, you gotta You gotta build these things up in such a way as to how you're gonna get the maximum benefit out of it. So lo and behold, The Undertaker lost last night. Okay. Uh, no one saw it coming. It kind of, like, even the the ending kind of came out of nowhere in the middle of the match, it seemed like. And I don't know if you've seen the reaction gifs from around the internet. Uh, you should go look them up if you have not. You could Make sure you, look up those gifs. Yeah, you should definitely go look up those gifs. Um it was like you just sucked all the oxygen out of the New Orleans Superdome. Like every, like it just went deathly silent for a couple of minutes there. Where there were some like weird screams and people just being like, "Oh my god!" There was one so they, guy. They, they tro- They just trolled the entire audience. I don't know. So this is this is the most puzzling part of it for me. I don't know what the end game for that is. 
it was definitely unexpected, and maybe that was the whole point. Maybe the whole point was, well, everybody sees this as a foregone conclusion, so fuck them. We're just going to give them the exact opposite of what they expect. And, you know, honestly, I, I, I certainly did not see it coming. I did not expect it. I was surprised, so I, I will give them that. That said, it seems like they kind of just tossed that whole thing kind of out the window just because they could, just for the sake of a shock, and it kind of blew everyone away, and not in a good way. So people are pissed. That was the way it ended? No, that was not the end of the show. There was a world title match at the end where the guy that everybody loved, Daniel Bryan, won the okay. world title, and everyone was very, very happy about that. Everyone in the chat right now is freaking out about our, our GIF, GIF pronunciation. Does it really matter? It doesn't. I've never thought it mattered. Well, I mean, I, it's, it's, it matters that you're wrong, but, you know, Fine, that's... I'm wrong. I don't even care. It, it really does not matter in the slightest. You people are crazy. Um, so, yes, it ended on a happy note. The guy everyone loved won. He was holding the belt. It was very enthusiastic. That said, it still felt like they kind of sucked all the energy mm. out of the room... And then they threw on the Divas match right after that, and that crowd could not have given less of a fuck about any of that. And then once the world title match, you know, energy kind of came back up, but still, it was just, it was a real shocker. Especially, you know, The Undertaker was one of the first, you know, wrestlers I ever paid attention to back when I was like eight or nine years old. When you just, when you just said that he is still wrestling, I was like, that guy has to be dead. How he wrestles he... once a year. He wrestles at WrestleMania, and oh, that that's is pretty much okay. it. Yeah, he is. He is not like ten months out of the year. He is not around because he is a very old man, and he looked it. He very much looked it in the ring. Like that He's dude be could in not his do 50s, much. Fifties, right? Yeah, yeah. He is. He is an old man. He has been doing this a very long time. He is beat up. He did not look like the Undertaker of old by any stretch. Uh, it was. It was pretty exhausting to watch him try and wrestle. And then when he lost, I was just like, maybe he just gave up. Maybe he's just like, you know what, I cannot do this anymore, and I'm just going to lay here, and this is going to be the end of it, because I cannot do this anymore. I don't is, know. Is Kane still a character? Yes, though now he is a uh, uh, he is a stooge for the corporate authority, okay. so he is known as Corporate Kane. Uh, he does not have the Again. mask anymore. He just comes out in slacks. Same. What? Yeah. Is he still in red, though? No. What? This is, wrestling is stupid. Also, he lost in, like, five minutes last night uh, uh, to the Shield. He just got his ass absolutely handed to him, so that was... Like, he fought like, he fought like a DVD box set? Yeah, pretty much. He was just done, so... Interesting. So, WrestleMania, so, it was so a good show. good? Interesting? Yeah, it was a good show all around. It was definitely the most consistently enjoyable wrestling show, uh, pay-per-view, I've watched in a good long time. Uh, and the most exciting part about it for me was the fact that the WWE Network actually worked the whole way through. Like great, right, this the is a big, big test, right? Of this new streaming service was millions and millions of people watching it all at once. Right, and honestly, they don't have millions and millions of users yet. They have probably, I'm guessing, a, a couple hundred thousand uh, who are are subscribed to the service. But they were presumably all those people were watching at once. Uh, and other than a little bit of chugging here and there, it worked. Like the system just worked. And I will give them credit for that because God, how many times? Have we, you know, engaged some major online service right when it launches and its first big event, and then everything just comes horribly crumbling down? And yeah, that's why it's why it's it's you know HBO Go crashes every single time there's a major premiere or finale. Uh, it's it's why I watched Game of Thrones on my actual TV through my cable box as opposed to hoping that HBO Go worked last night for the premiere. Yeah, and you know, and it. it Again, not nearly the numbers, I'm guessing, as something like, you know, all the people who are using their parents' HBO Go passwords, because Lord knows all those people are not subscribing to HBO Go, like, for real. Right. Um, but it was, you know, it, 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 there was still the expectation that, like, there would be enough people all watching this at once that it will probably crap out. And it didn't. You know, it sounds like some people online had a few issues, but it, for the most part, the show ran smoothly, and that was the thing I was most impressed by. I was able to watch it exactly the way they said it would, and it worked, and I was very happy with it. Well, it sounds like, for you wrestling fans, it sounds like WrestleMania was... It's, it's long, too, right? Four hours or something like that? Yeah, it was a... lot a, of time. It was a four-hour show with, like, two hours of pre-show and then, like, another hour of post-show, which Ooh. I did not watch any of that stuff. But, yeah, they really milk the WrestleMania thing as, like, an all-day kind of deal. Interesting. 
Yeah. So I didn't watch that. I watched Game of Thrones. But then I, I watched that too. It was good. It was good. It was good. Um, was so two game after I finished my writing up, uh, my, you know, my my pass on my Pax East presentation, uh, I loaded up because I, uh, I hadn't checked it out. I finally I finally loaded up Loof Trousers, which is excellent. Like, yes, I, mean, it I is. don't know how, I don't know how much I have to say about it except to say it's really good. It's pretty amazing how much mileage they get out of a very 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 simple concept. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of that mileage comes from the fact that the controls feel so damn good yep. that you just want to jump in over and over and over again. And the fact that every match only takes, like, 90 seconds... You're lucky you, if you make it three minutes. Yeah, is it makes it so it's very it, very comfortable to just jump in immediately again. I love the fact that even when you're, like, you know, you hit down or right or whatever to, to get to the hangar to kind of adjust... Your your outfit, you just hit up and then boom, you're back out there and you're flying again. Like everything yep. is just there's no resolution options. It's not quite widescreen. Like all of these stuff doesn't really matter. It uh it's just simple. It's it's well made. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, although it's not usually my bag to play, uh act, you know sort of score action games like this, I do like the fact that I have these mini goals that are 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 giving me reasons to to try different sort of strategies, try out different equipment, because it seems like it's very easy to kind of just fall into the trap of, hey, this worked for me on a good scoring run. I'm just going to stick with this over and over again. Yeah, I you know, I got to a point where I liked just having the randomization turned on at all times, uh, because I, you know, the, obviously there are a few different combinations that I like the best, but uh, there's a certain joy in just kind of not knowing what you're going to get and trying to make the best of it. Um that to me was what made it the the you know what what made me keep going back to it again and again. One was just to you know see what combinations I would get, and see, and two just see how well I could do with those. Uh, and the fact that there are so many different combinations of things you can try, uh, and also so many different little soundtrack combinations that come along with it, just you know would get me going for hours at a time just to keep uh, keep on you know trying those out. Uh, I still play that game. I still play it on my Vita. I still play it. You know, I'd like it's the only thing I'd boot up my PS3 for at this point. Um, I'll I'll definitely dedicate you know an hour to that each night before I go to bed because it is it is fun. I still haven't beaten my goddamn score from like weeks ago. But uh, what's your highest score? Uh, I think it's like twenty thousand at this point, which is you know not bad, but not spectacular either. Uh, yeah, I think my my I I mean I, I've only played forty minutes, but uh, yeah, I, I hit. Like uh, just under fourteen thousand. Like while well, this morning, yeah. before we started chatting, I loaded it up and I got, I got my best score yet. I, I mean, for a while I had been uh, spending a lot of time using the laser weapon because it like allow while I'm still getting used to the physics and like the rolling of of the plane, uh, especially depending on which body types that you're using. Like the laser kind of allows you, it gives you a little bit of room for error because. Yeah. Things that come in your path are just going to get hit, um, but that seems like maybe long term not the best weapon because it's kind of weak. Uh, it is. So, so even it's, though it's it's kind of a good like hey getting used to Luffrauser's weapon like if you want like really high end scores uh, if you want to be able to take out like like the battle cruisers with like you know a max combo going like you're not gonna do that with the laser. No, and on top of that, you turn slower when you're firing the laser, so it's hard right. to really nail any specific enemy. The only thing that one's really good for is hitting the uh, the smaller ships uh, in the sea. Those are the ones that you can kind of nail the best with the laser, but everything else, that one doesn't really work. I've... So my personal favorites thus far are the the giant circle of doom, the one that like spreads off a bunch of different little smaller bullets when it explodes on stuff. It takes forever to hit anything, and it takes a while to recharge, but when you actually hit stuff with it, it man, it does a lot of damage. I haven't, uh, got, I haven't unlocked that one yet. I've, do you have the I've homing been, missiles yet? I, had, I got the homing missiles, but I have not really... I used it like once or twice, and it didn't go very well. The homing missiles are only really good in tandem with other things, like the, when you're using the uh, the engine that just propels bullets. That's mm -hmm. a good one for that. Uh, and when you can drop like the nuke when you die, that's another good one to go with that. But the homing missiles don't really home in that well unless you are aimed specifically at what you want to kill. Otherwise, they're not really that great. But I've gotten better at, uh, at at making those work for me. It took me a while though. They're not. They're definitely not. Specific. They're not going to actually home in on just every enemy on the screen. So, so gotta... is the is the nuke when you die like what you want? Like if you think that well, this is it. I'm I'm not gonna make it. I want to make the most of this max combo and try and make this my highest score yet. 
Like I haven't seen the blimp yet. I've gotten the battle cruiser, but is that like just hey, I'm gonna go blow myself up and hopefully take this ship out with me and get well, the, that extra four grand or whatever? The nuke when you die just goes off when you die. You can't really plan for it exactly. It just sort of happens. Um, but when you do die, it kills all the enemies that are on the screen, including stuff that's like at the bottom and the top. So hmm. you know. You don't get max score, like, combo points for that, but you do get points, and that is useful. Um, so I, you know, I like keeping that that particular engine or body design uh, just for the sake of, of getting a little few extra points at the end. I'm sure there are better uh, body designs that I could be using, but I just like that one because it, it kills everything, and I like revenge, so. Yeah, I, yeah I, I love the simplicity of it. It's it's a blast to play. I am, I'm definitely going to pick up the, the Vita version so that I can... I can that that seems like the one to play. I've been enjoying the the one on the PC, and it's it's cool to have it on a big screen and all. But it does seem like the Vita version is <clears throat> is probably the optimal way to play that game. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's it's definitely the thing I am playing on my Vita now. So now I actually have two handheld games. I'm playing on a regular basis. I'm playing Love Rousers on Vita, and I've got Rusty's Real Deal Baseball on the 3DS. And I'm gonna keep playing that. I'm gonna I want to see that story the whole damn way through. I want to see what happens to Rusty Slugger. <laughs> I don't know if I want to see what happens to Rusty. I, it seems like things aren't going well, but maybe the more you buy, the better his life is. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's that's the hope. Out. Either that or you, you knock on the door and you walk in there and it's like, oh, hey, check it out. Here's Rusty's feet dangling from the ceiling. He hung himself with cleat laces and it's like, oh, no. Oh, no. That's not cool. That's not fun. I, you are not going to get uh, hired as a writer at Nintendo that way, Alex. Or am I? Working on this is the this is the new nihilistic, pessimistic Nintendo. This is the this is the Nintendo that no longer cares if it lives or dies. It's just going to tell you the truth about life. It's going to tell you the real shit. The real shit is we all die. Everything is sad. Everything is horrible. Buy these fucking mini games. What do you care? You're going to be dead in twenty years anyway. If not, you know. If not from, you know, some horrible disease, then perhaps by your own hand, because life, it's meaningless. God damn it. Stop the show. <laughs> Stop it. Fine. Do you want me to say GIF? Is that what is that what you're trying to get out of me? That's really you're that's really to get me to just say GIF? Like yeah. A fucking monster. Life is meaningless. How d does it matter how you pronounce a GIF or GIF? It does not matter. It does matter. We all die. Everything, everything We're matters. all dirt in the end. Oh, god damn it. I don't know how to pull us out of this one. There there really is no pulling us out of it. Frouser's tailspin. Yeah. Did you see uh, the, the blog post that <clears throat> Flambeer put up over the weekend? I did not. What did they put up? They put up... So there were uh, a couple folks on Twitter, <clears throat> including uh, Rob Dubbin, who is a writer on The Colbert Report, and <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Let it and out, man. Elizabeth Simmons, who is uh, an artist, she's done some uh, comics on Kotaku, some other places. I know um, Elizabeth Simmons. Simmons is. Okay, I'm just I'm explaining for the audience, Alec. Oh, fair enough. Uh, both of them you can follow on Twitter, and if you go to their Twitter accounts, you can you can pull up uh, some of their commentary. I, I would like to actually find Rob Dubbins. Uh, basically, both uh, expressed a little bit of. Uh, Ambivalence over the game's seemingly Nazi imagery and mm. uh, the fact that you would be a Nazi pilot. Uh, not saying that the game was necessarily wrong for including it. Uh, mostly just saying that it made them uncomfortable because of their backgrounds. Um, and that seems understandable. And so uh, Vlambeer, uh, uh Rami, who we had on our uh, GDC uh couch a couple of weeks back and should have on the morning show I think the Monday after PAX East I think is awesome. what, what him and I talked about uh, he wrote this lengthy blog post basically explaining their design process how you know they don't consider while they certainly you know looked at Nazi imagery and you know being from the Netherlands like you know they have you know a cultural history <laughs> with the Nazis and talked a lot about very specifically their aesthetic process their design process you know apologized if you were offended but said that that was not their intention and explained what their intentions were and then both Rob and Elizabeth read it and said that's great and it was really wonderful to see you guys explain where you were coming from everyone feels better about it and I don't know it was super great I don't think it was a controversy I just think it was awesome that some people explained how they felt about a game 
The developer explained why they made what they made, and everyone seemed to come away with a butter understanding on all sides. A butter understanding. Mm-hmm. Real yeah, butter. No, I, when I was reviewing that game, I, I thought long and hard about the way to address that thing because, yeah, you, could, you look at that, you look at the character art in that game, you could definitely very easily take that away from that game. Um, but that said, you know, I, I the more I played it, the more I was just like, you know what, this is just kind of a neat aesthetic. It's it's playing off some of the visual attributes of you know World War II and the German army and 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 all of that. And but at the same time, there's no Nazi imagery. There's nothing in there that's really specifically offensive. I could see why you might be uncomfortable with it, but you know, for my part, I was never made uncomfortable while playing it, and I felt like, if anything, it just sort of added to the sort of weird, stark imagery that they were going for in that game. So, you know, I totally get that perspective, but when I was reviewing it, I just said, you know what, this is not... To me, this is not worth making a big thing out of. It was enough for me to just say, I like the visual style of this game, I like what they're doing with it. Um, so I kind of left that alone. I might, you know, and it, it took this long after release for it to really see it kind of get addressed, which says to me that maybe it wasn't, you know, really that 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 horrible of a thing. But like you said, if if but I, no, I but, that, but that's that a, so that's that's what like this is what like so neither person that was criticizing the game yeah. was doing so in a hyperbolic sense. right. Nobody on either side, the two people that sort of started this dialogue. Uh, Elizabeth and, and Rob and, and Rami, you know, one of the co-developers of right. uh, Lufrazers, neither side was screaming at each other. Like, all, all Rob and Elizabeth did was explain, because of their background, this was something that made them feel uncomfortable, the way the game, you know, could be seen or interpreted as reveling in Nazi imagery, or, right. you know, but said, you know, we're just expressing how we felt playing your game. And Rami then explained how they developed the aesthetic, like how they arrived at that, some of his cultural background, some of the cultural background of the Netherlands, and said, we appreciate you explaining your side, and here's our side of it. And then everyone... Like, that's how this should work, right? And, totally. And, like, that is how criticism should work in its most ideal form, is, is someone explaining why a game or anything, a movie or, or whatever, makes them feel a certain way, and the creator has an opportunity to, to listen to that, to choose to respond or not to respond. But when you get these moments where you have someone really thoughtful like Romney who does respond in a, in a really precise, articulate way, you get exactly what you want out of a critical exchange, which is you shared your idea, that person shared their idea back, and then everyone comes away with a deeper understanding of how one person could interpret a product and what the person who made the product uh, intended to when they created it, which I right. think, you know, T. Wester says it's really a non-troversy, which I agree because that's how this stuff should should it shouldn't be controversial when someone criticizes something because it's not, you know, I think people often get the words censorship and criticism uh, overlapping in a way that isn't actually true uh, for folks that express those viewpoints. It's more just expressing a view and then it's cool when a developer has uh, you know an opportunity to respond in a thoughtful manner. I think it's a great template and I would hope that more critics and developers you know looked at this and said this is how we should handle this stuff you know in yeah. the future. Someone in the chat just said it's a real shame that Rami had to give these morons the time of day and I think that's exactly the wrong way to look at it. It's like yeah, it, you may not agree with the fact that they took some umbrage with this, that they, you know, they they felt un were made uncomfortable by this aspect of the game, but you know, them raising concerns in the way that it sounds like they did, which is to say, not freak out about it, but to you know, explain in detail what it was that made them feel uncomfortable, and then for Rami to actually address that and for them to have a conversation about it, like. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that on any possible level. The one thing I have noticed about Rami in in following him on Twitter and you know kind of seeing how he he deals with people is that Tom Rami makes time for just about everybody. Like even if people are just calling him names or saying horrible things to him, like he is still willing to address that with people and he wants to talk to people and he wants to kind of understand what they're where they're coming from on stuff. And I think that is like the one of the most admirable traits you can possibly have, especially as someone who you know, create stuff like this and, you know, obviously doesn't sort of have the time to, you know, just sit around talking to people about what they make. Like, I think it's cool that he goes out of his way 
to address these things, and I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to reading this post. It sounds like he addressed it pretty intelligently. I think that is 100% the way, like, the model for how people should address things like this is be as thoughtful as humanly possible. Listen to people's concerns. You don't have to agree with everything they say, but it never, ever hurts to just listen and consider. Yeah, it's just basic empathy. Like, if you yeah. read, the, you know, the subtext of his, of his blog post is, I'm sorry you feel that way. We're sorry if we offended you, but this is why we did what we did. So he's not, the game's not getting an aesthetic overhaul. The game is not going to be changed in any way. The design is not going to be impacted as a result of these concerns. It's a developer looking at the way people played his product. These are paying consumers that just happen to be, in some cases, prominent critics or or artists or what have you, uh, expressing a response to something that, that Rami and, and uh, his co-developer, who unfortunately, whose name escapes me right now, created, and then saying, we're sorry you feel that way, but this is why we did what we did, so hopefully you can understand where we're coming from. And so, you know, yeah, that guy you point out who says, like, why should he give those assholes the time of day? Because Rami's a nice guy. Yeah. Because Rami, like, as a good developer, has good developer relations and good customer relations. And... This makes him look like a thoughtful developer that considers how people react to his products. It doesn't mean you need to respond to everyone, right? Like, that's not, not what I think either uh, of us are saying, is that no. anytime someone says, hey, like, I don't, I don't like this about your game, like, you need to write, you know, an 800-word blog post. But no. clearly, if Rami spent that time doing it, then he thought it was worth addressing. And yeah. uh, to get upset at the people who originally... Uh, said something uh, because Rami responded to it. Rami doesn't have to. Like this, he did it because he wanted to, and clearly putting that much thought into it, uh, it was something that he wanted to address, and you know maybe it was something that he thought about while making the game. And it's you know we learned something about the game's creative process. I'm super glad to have read that and and gotten a better understanding of how they arrived at that uh, aesthetic and sort of design values and. I don't know. I just I wish there were more of this. And even though you know, I don't think us talking about it turns it into a controversy. It's just more no. pointing out like this is great, and this is how these dialogues don't devolve into people screaming at each other, saying you're a monster. Why would you do this? Because this is an example of someone having a thoughtful response, and then uh, that developer having uh, you know an explanation uh, to to address that, which. I don't know. It just makes it, it made me really happy, even yeah. if it you know sometimes got a little out of control over the weekend with some of the stuff that happened around it that isn't worth I think getting into. But right. core, someone says something, the developer responds. I think is great. Yeah. Anytime there is a thoughtful conversation about this kind of stuff, it is worthwhile. Even if I don't care if you think it's you know people complaining or whining or what have you, it's like no. There is always a worthwhile conversation to be had about this stuff, and it sounds like they did. That's the first thing I'm going to read as soon as we are done with this show, because I want to see what he had to say. And I'm glad we're having him on the show. I've always wanted to talk to Rami. I've never actually met him. Yeah, he is, he's a super great guy, uh, very nice, uh, and uh, he's, he's wonderful at... Uh, he's very good at articulating, uh, as you can see like in, yeah. in his blog post and all, and all the talks he does. Like He has a real way of explaining his methodology, whether it's just him personally or, you know, Vlambeer as a studio, uh, you know, even, you know, the way uh, on our GDC couch when uh, we were talking about free-to-play models, and he broke down exactly mechanically how they would have adjusted Ridiculous Fishing to be a free-to-play game. Uh, so, like, the fact that he can talk about that stuff off the top of his head makes him uh, a really fascinating figure. So, yeah, you know, I, th I think the Monday After PAX is what we talked about. Um, that dude is... Travels so much that there is a website called isramiintheNetherlands.com, so that his friends know if he's actually around or not. I've seen him mention that a few times. I I, I I did not realize he was he was the John Drake of Europe. Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that people should check out the blog post. Uh, it's it's really really good, and I was happy that that exchange happened. Yeah. <laughs> I like I stay puffed in the chat, Sam. Sam Rami, the director of Evil Dead. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's exactly what we're talking about. He made Love Trousers. That's why he hasn't made that made another Evil Dead movie. Exactly. Uh, the uh, the the last game I played over the weekend. Um, and if people want to start dropping questions in the chat, we could address a couple before we close this out. Uh, was uh, I played Half Minute Hero Two? Mm -hmm. How was that? 
It's awesome. It's charming okay. as hell. I did not play the original. Uh, Neither did I. Aren't aware of what Half Minute Hero is. It basically is a super fast JRPG in which the moment a quest begins, you have 30 seconds to accomplish that quest. Uh, which okay. Sounds ridiculous, uh, but the way you know the mechanics are deeper than just 30 seconds. As you you don't actually engage in combat. You are in an overworld, and it'll transition to a combat scene, but it all takes place really, really fast and automatically. So basically, you're just like running over enemies, leveling up, uh, you're getting gold drops and experience points, and then you can spend money at a shrine to rewind the time back to the full 30 seconds. But every time right. you do that, it costs more and more money, so you, you still need to kind of finish the quest in about you know 90 seconds, all told. Right. Uh, even if you're uh, spending more uh, money to uh, get more time. But it's just really, really quick. The dialogue is super witty, very funny, and uh, I've, I've been enjoying the hell out of the, the, the hour and a half or so that, that I played. And even though I didn't play the original, which I think you can get on PSP, uh, this new one is on the PC, and it doesn't sound like it's coming to anything else uh, in terms of uh, releases. But, yeah, I... I recommend checking it out. It's it's a ton of fun. It's unlike anything I've ever played. And if you get tired of the fact that JRPGs are really slow, well, Half Minute Hero is the complete opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like if nothing, it's a it's briskly paced. I think I remember watching Brad play the original one, uh, however many years ago that came out. And I remember thinking that was kind of neat, and then never actually getting around to playing it. So now that there's a new one, now I can actually dig into that and play it. I probably will. Hopefully, maybe, possibly. You got a lot of games you're saying you're gonna play, Alex. I do. I have a lot of things just sitting here waiting to be played. Uh, I still need to finish Infamous. I have Age of Wonders 3 sitting here. I have, like, you know, I, I want to play more FTLs so I can do a, a, a quick video on the new content and stuff. Like, there's just... There are a lot of games I need to sit down and I need to play, but, you know, time and WrestleMania did not necessarily allow for it this weekend. Uh... I did watch my girlfriend finish South Park again, uh, even though I'd already played through it. I, I, I enjoyed it enough to where I was happy just watching her play. And mm -hmm. uh, she really liked it. And you know what? The humor in that game held up enough to where I was perfectly happy sitting there watching all the jokes happen again. That, to me, is a sign of a really funny game. So, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if they're going to do the, the DLC or not, or if all that DLC is just going to... You know, was just sort of the weapon packs and, and things like that when, when the game launched. I haven't seen them... Mention anything? I have no idea if that game sold well or not. I, I believe I saw a quote from uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker that basically amounted to, "We'd like to make another one, maybe someday," but it doesn't sound like they're exactly chomping at the bit to make a another video game. Sounds Pretty like they put a lot of work into that one, so I'm not surprised that they uh, are reluctant to just jump into another one. And I think by now they would have said if there was DLC content coming. Usually they're pretty quick out of the gate to be like, hey, by the way, there's more coming. Don't, don't, you know, throw away your Xbox yet. Cause well, and if they didn't sell a season pass, then that probably, yeah. I guess that's maybe the most telling thing of all. Even though season passes have certainly subsided, Ubisoft still engages with them, so if there was going to be a lot of that for South Park, maybe we would have heard about it already. Yeah. So, uh, Ocelot Fox asks, what are you expecting out of this week's Wolf Among Us Episode 3? Uh, this being the third episode, I imagine this is the episode where they are going to get down to business of, you know, very clearly establishing who are the characters you're going to be going up against for the long haul, who are, like, what, what is the, the actual meat of this, you know, weird conspiracy that seems to be going on, going to boil down to, uh, I'm not going to talk about any specifics to the story, I'm not going to talk about, you know, any potential spoilers here, I just want to, I'm hoping that now that we're at the over the hump point, you know, there's been a lot of table setting. There's been a lot of establishing thus far. I'm hoping that now they're going to get into the meat of the story and they're just going to let, you know, the wolf come out, shall we say. And oh, him, see, uh, hey, really... well, welcome, to the, welcome to the awkward phrasing chain. I love it. Yeah, that is, uh, that is phrasing, yes. Uh, no, but I'm, if nothing else, I'm just hoping that it's, you know, exciting because the last one was, was pretty short and didn't have a whole lot going on. Uh, I'm, I would like there to be more more in this one, more stuff happening. So, we'll see. Interesting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to playing it as well. Uh, it feels like this one's coming a lot quicker. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that is literally true, but it certainly feels that way. Uh, so, I'm, I'm excited to play it. You know, it's one of the few games I sit down and play with my wife, so uh, that gives me an excuse to 
to play that just before leaving for PAX, uh, which uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, Mixed Up Zombies asks, when do you give up on trying to get interviews from specific people asking because of all the 2048 stuff? For me, if they don't respond once, I kind of give up. Uh, that, that certainly depends on the kind of story that I'm pursuing. Um, usually what you want to do, because at least I'm someone that most people end up responding to because you know I work for a major website and have a following, uh, you try and give people uh, a certain amount of time to respond You know, instead of just saying like, hey, you've got... 20 minutes before a story goes up. Right. Uh, you want to, you know, say, hey, you know, I'm working on a story. I'm looking to have it go up later this week. I'm flexible on the time frame. Uh, please let me know if you have an opportunity to get back to me regarding, you know, X or Y topic, or maybe I'll send along a list of questions for them to consider. Uh, because if they don't want to talk uh, over Skype or phone or, or anything like that, at least there are a set of questions that can address my immediate concerns. And I tend to give them a time frame. Uh, in order to get back to me if I if I have something that I'm writing uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the only time where I will not give too much uh, leeway is if I'm breaking a big story. Uh, for example, you know, working on the Infinity Ward story from years back or the Xbox One DRM stuff. I tend to not give companies more than 30 minutes because what happens is if you give them too much time to respond, if they'd already been preparing an announcement, they will put that announcement out before you can publish your story. Right. Uh, and I have been burned on that in the past where I gave a company too long of a, of a heads up and they managed to get their own news out ahead of me publishing my story. So, uh, which is a smart PR tactic. They don't owe anything to me uh, no. in terms of, well, he knew first, aw shucks, we should let him go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so you want to give the PR team just long enough uh, to, to feel the heat uh, and to get a prepared statement together, but you don't want to give them long enough uh, in order to uh, actually come up with uh, a, a large uh, uh, official response uh, that kind of takes the story away from you. But those, those don't happen all the time, by and large, uh, when I'm contacting developers. The vast majority get back to me very quickly and... Uh, I, I usually give them, you know, a day or two, which is seems pretty reasonable. I would think so, yeah. That seems, like, correct. Mm, 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 mm. how early this week can we expect to see or hear something about the PC version of Dark Souls 2? I don't know. I know Brad not? has it. Dark Souls. I, don't know, I don't know when he's planning on doing stuff for it, but uh, I know that... Uh, PC. That's not out this week. That's out later this month, I think. Mm -hmm. April 25th. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'd imagine that, you know, unfortunately you are asking the wrong people. Uh, those kinds of early access to games is mostly going to happen in the San Francisco office, but I am looking forward to seeing Dark Souls 2 on PC. I'm looking forward to playing that game again uh, with uh, a different class of character. I don't know if I'll actually go through the entire game, but I've never played with magic in Dark Souls, so I want to see how the PC version looks. I think it'd be fun to stream some of that, and so I'm, I don't know when we'll be able to inform you of what the PC version looks like, but I'm definitely looking forward to playing it. Yeah. Mm, well, I think uh, we've covered most of the other questions people asked about the Amazon box, but we talked about that last week. We did, we did. So, what's your what's your schedule this week? You're when are you heading to Boston? So, uh, this week, I Jeff is actually flying into town on Tuesday uh, here in New York. Uh, he is giving a talk at NYU's uh, Metro Tech campus in Brooklyn on Wednesday night uh, from 7 to 9. I believe that event is already sold out, so you may have to go stab someone for tickets if uh, if you plan on going to that. I will be going with him to that. Uh, I have no idea what his talk is about, but Jeff's in New York, so obviously I'm going. Uh, and then he and I are driving to PAX on Thursday. Uh, we'll be getting in on Thursday night. I think that's when, everyone, when the rest of you guys are flying in as well, correct? I, well, I fly into Boston on Wednesday afternoon. To, okay. to meet up with Zoe Quinn to go over our PAX East presentation, so uh, I'll be there. I'll be there a lot earlier, I think. And uh, Katie's actually flying in. She's she's coming out for this because she's got some friends in Boston, and she's never been to PAX. And I was like, you know what? You should see this PAX thing. <laughs> it's worth seeing at least once. Uh, and I'm giving that talk on Friday, so she she wanted to come out and and see that because she likes to to support me. I don't know, like I think that's what they call it, supporting. Like your significant other, I don't, I don't. It's weird, yeah. I, something like that. 
And so we, she'll be in Thursday morning, and so we'll, we'll be there early, and maybe we'll go and do something in Boston on Thursday. I don't, like, what do you do in Boston? I've never done anything, because I'm always just out there drinking. Uh, let's see. You go to a Red Sox game. Nope. Uh, you could get drunk. No, uh, you could get drunk and go to a Red Sox game. I think that's it. I think that's literally all there is to do in Boston. I guess I'll just go. I'll just go sit outside of Harmonix. Yeah. Throw stuff at people that I know. They're yeah. I mean, they they walk in and out of there regularly to, throughout the day. I'm sure you'll be able to throw lots and lots of things. Just you know, mind some of the uh, the the stabbier people that hang out in Central Square. Mm-hmm. They're uh, okay. just you know, if if someone gives you the crazy eye, just just walk a few feet down the block. Okay, good. Uh, you up to anything this week before PAX East? You just Getting ready for PAX East. Getting ready for PAX East. I'm going to try and record uh, a quick look solo for FTL so that uh, people can get a look at the new content for that Sweet. stuff. Uh, I really, really like it. Uh, other than that, no reviews or anything. Just uh, getting ready to leave for the show on Thursday. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Awesome. Well, uh, we are not going to have a show on Friday because we will have a show on Saturday. Yes, we will. Uh, that will be live. Uh, I believe it starts at 9 p.m. Uh, on uh, East Coast time, uh, and it will be streamed live. From what we are told, it is the, the streaming stuff apparently has worked pretty well in the past. So it won't be on Giant Bombs Twitch or YouTube channel. But my understanding is that we are going to have it on the site, uh, right, and right. you'll be able to be in the chat uh, to hang out uh, while the panel is going on. Uh, so look for that on Saturday night. Uh, my panel on Friday, for what I was told, is not going to be streamed. Uh, but I do. I'm going to. See if Vinny and Drew uh, can uh, record it, or I will uh, record the audio uh, myself, and I'll try and put that up sometime over the weekend so that people uh, can check that out if they'd if they'd like to. But unfortunately, not streamed. But we will get you an archive of it, one way or the other. And then there'll be interview dump trucks. We'll probably shoot some stuff. Probably have too much to drink on one of those oh, nights. Yeah. Uh, and. Of course. and do not forget about the Royal Rumble on Sunday morning yep. in the Albatross Theater, 10.30 a.m. Is that streaming? I don't win the Royal Rumble. Is that streaming? Do you know? That is, It is a streaming-capable theater. I believe it is going to be streamed. I don't know to where yet. I will try and send out uh, some Twitter notifications about where you can watch that as soon as I know. Okay. Sweet. Well, I think that covers uh, everything that we're doing for Bax East. Once again... Check Facebook. Uh, there is a invite to hang out with some of us on Friday night from 8 to 10 at some beer garden uh, in Boston. I'll definitely be there. Um, I know that it coincides with the Cards Against Humanity panel, so that's unfortunate. But as is most things with PAX, something is always colliding uh, with something else. So Naturally. Uh, that is unfortunately just kind of the way it works out. Uh, then hopefully we will be back next Monday, assuming all goes well uh, with our lives and I make it through Boston alive. Not, where, you know, slightly concerned about it. Now you've got me worried about stabbings. Yeah, I mean that's 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 the correct thing to be worried about. Though, I mean, in most of Boston, I wouldn't really worry about that. It's literally it's just in front of the Harmonics building that all the okay. stabbings happen. So that seems that seems uh, that seems right. Uh, are you gonna, are you gonna cut a promo video? The people making these promo videos for this wrestling thing. Uh, I cut like an hour and 20 minute promo video in the form of an Encyclopedia oh Bombastica for WrestleMania okay. 2000. All right, uh, so I people definitely should look some, to that. Yeah, I did some shit talking of my opponents in that video, so if you haven't checked that out yet, by all means do so. But yes, I am going to win the Royal Rumble. There is no doubt about it. Well, I look forward to it. I will be there. Uh, maybe I should make a sign of some sort. I should think about that. Uh, you definitely should. Uh, so I'll be there. Uh, I don't fly out till uh, that afternoon. And... We'll be back next Monday, I think, with the beers around me, but don't... I'm not going to guarantee that. To it. That is off the top of my head that that's what we talked about and we haven't chatted about in a couple weeks. But if it's not next Monday, we'll have him on real soon, uh, as soon as we can. But Alex, I will... I guess I'll see you on Thursday. Ooh, yeah! <laughs> God damn it.